everyone, it's Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date outlook for all of our friends in Maryland. We're going to be taking a good look at D.C. in this video. I know we've got some folks on the channel who want some details there up in Montgomery County and in Baltimore. In the NCI4, we saw a lot of variation in Maryland's outlook depending on location. If you're on the Chesapeake Bay, you're facing some really serious sea level rise issues. It continues to surprise me that your region doesn't receive frequent national attention for these issues because you're not only on the leading edge of risk, you're on the leading edge of trying to find ways to deal with these serious problems. I want to give you a little background. We're talking about serious problems for this outlook. When I founded American Resiliency in 21 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C at mid-century. That was the consensus science, but that was then. 2023, as you should know, was a very serious year in climate. We hit 2C for a couple of days towards the end of 23. We've been at or above 2 a few days here in 2024. 2023 was the first full year the Earth spent over 1.5C. That's over the pre-industrial baseline. That's over the baseline set by the Paris Accords. We didn't expect this to happen as recently as 21, but it is happening now. And that forces us to change our thinking. So this outlook we're looking at, it's a 2C outlook. It's what we'd expect in an average global temp at 2C over pre-industrial baseline. As far as when that's going to happen, seems like we're all going to find out. And it's likely to come sooner than 2050. So let's check out the challenge level for Maryland at 2C. Just so you know where to find my source material, this outlook is based on the National Climate Assessment. This was recently updated in November of 2023. There have been some significant changes in the projections in this new edition. We're updating the outlook for every state. This is the highest consensus climate science available. And if you want to follow along with the figures as I'm going through it, go to chapters, all figures. You'll find them listed by number. And I say the number but when I show the figure. And you can download them. They could come into a nice zip file, and then you've got them for offline access, if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's worth noting, your tax dollars paid for the development and review of the National Climate Assessment. You deserve access to this information. As a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about this important information, about this important national document. That's what motivated me to found this organization, American Resiliency. It's the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information directly to the public. We run on your donations. Let's keep going. Looking at a national overview for changes at 2C, let's check out figure 1.14. You can see here that Maryland is in this moderate change band, kind of smack in the center where we would expect a total of five to six degrees F heat up over the course of the year. Let's see where it falls seasonally. I think it's auspicious that if you look at these three bands, Maryland is falling right in the middle of the most moderate band. Let's, let's find out more. Here in figure 2.11, we can figure more about how that change is going to fall over the course of the year, where we look at changes projected for hot and cold extremes at 2C. And for Maryland, this doesn't look too bad, but let's look at your specific threats. First, the summer and then the winter. We're zooming in on hot days, on days over 95. And you see these are some pretty light colors. So you're getting some additional days over 95, but it's not too bad. And it's especially not too bad in this delightfully preserved chunk over in Western Maryland, which we're going to keep hitting this as a really nice area. If we look in the developed corridor here, you're in the third color, the third gradient as we head towards red. That's an additional 10 to 15 days over 95 during the day. So I know DC, Baltimore, you have like a pretty sweaty season in the summer. It looks like it's going to get longer. And you see we're over in a new figure here. This is additional nights over 70. This is where you really got some challenges coming at you in the summer, where we see over by DC, over by Baltimore, strongest right towards the sea and towards the urban cores. We're looking at red there, which is about a month of additional nights over 70. So you're not going to get good nighttime cooling. We look like we're going to see some pretty accelerated urban heat island effects because of the combination with the low elevation and the fact that this water is going to act like a heat buffer. It's going to make it not cool off so much. As you get north of D.C., as you get into like northern Montgomery County, it should be a bit less, but still notable, maybe another 20 days over 70. 
And look at this gorgeous preservation again over here in Western Maryland. So range of outcomes across the state in terms of summer change, but in terms of your additional days over 95, not too bad, not as bad as you would see in many other parts of the US. Let's talk about the cold. In Maryland, we see fairly even cold loss here. So this, we're still in figure 2.11, but here we're looking at the loss of days at or below 32. We see across the state projected three to four weeks less of cold there with a couple of elevation related hot spots. These red spots, they're gonna have even more cold loss. They're gonna have more than a month for sure of cold loss. And so that's the duration of the winter. We're looking at a shorter duration cold season across the state. Let's look at the intensity of the winter, looking over at figure 11.3. So here we are with figure 11.3. You can see this is a big figure, kind of a lot to take in. So I decided to take some snips of Maryland at the present day climate normal and the mid-century projection along with the key. We'll go over that in a second so that you can see what to expect at 2C. It's worth noting there's also 3C data available here in figure 11.3. And here we see the SNP, and this is really a pretty mild level of change, where across the state you're either moving one or two colors, meaning either a 5 or a 10 degree Fahrenheit increase in your winter lows, a lifting up of the winter lows. You can see that in much of this highly conserved part of Western Maryland, what we're really looking at there is just a one zone shift. Two right on the ridge line there for most of it, just a one zone shift combined with the relatively mild outlook for the summer. I think that this is potentially hopeful for your forested areas. Down here in more of your urban core of Maryland, you're talking about a two zone shift. So a 10 degree lift in your winter lows. Let's take a look at your precipitation outlook. We'll start with that over here in figure 210, where you can see that depending on where you are in the state, at 2C, you're expecting either 5 or 10% more precipitation, which is good. You want a little more water to help plants survive that increased heat in the summers. If you look down at 3C, we'd expect much of the state to be fairly stable in terms of overall levels of precipitation, with precipitation increasing most notably near the coast. Let's look at another model. Let's maybe get some more details. In 4.3, we're looking at increases in precipitation in terms of number of inches, where we can see fairly stable couple of inches, just a couple of inches of additional precipitation over Maryland. But I think that this is important. If we look at this breakout of the ensemble model, we can see the driest average 20% of the projections, where a lot of the country is in drought in the driest 20% of the projections. But you'll see that Maryland is over the margin there. Even in the driest models, it looks like Maryland is going to be fairly water stable, is going to have some water, which let me tell you, if you're going to have to lean towards the too much water or the not enough water side of the problem, you want the too much water side. You can see the risk for places getting like too much water, too extreme of a deluge-like storm in figure 212 here, where we look at projected changes to precipitation extremes at 2C of global warming. There's a lot going on here. I look for repeating patterns, and there's actually good news for Maryland on this figure, and that you don't have notably interesting repeating patterns. Like in Maine, for example, where we do see some particular counties that are going to get really hammered by really intense deluge-like behavior. It looks like Maryland, you are seeing an increase projected in the amount of precipitation per storm, 10 to 15% increase. You're not looking at any particularly serious hot spots, so that's good news. So as we narrow in on your big threat, Maryland, it's time to look at sea level rise. In figure 9.2 here, we can see that on a business as usual pathway, on the expected model of warming, you'd be projected to hit about two feet of sea level rise by 2050. But I really think we also need to model 10 feet in case of AMAP collapse. I feel like that gives us the full reasonable range of what to expect in the next 20 years. And on the whole AMOC collapse issue, you know, even in 2022, very few mainstream scientists would have raised that as alarm. It was thought to be very unlikely to happen anytime this century. But we have a number of alarm bells now ringing pretty loud that we could see AMOC collapse, a major change in Earth's ocean current patterns in the next five to 10 years. That would accelerate melting in Antarctica, which we are observing happening now, and lead to much more substantial sea level rise across the globe, like 13 feet of rise. So let's take a look at that range of modeling now in the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. This is a great tool. You can enter your address and you can check out what's likely to happen at your house, in your community. Very great level of specificity. Let's look at DC first. As we zoom in on DC, 
we can see that there's already like some marshy stuff in DC. We know that DC lies a little bit low in the water right now at the current mean high or high water mark. And at two feet, we would see that accelerated and we'd see some land loss north of the naval base and the golf course is starting to get messed up. Let's see what happens at 10 feet. This is pretty wild, right? I think we see not a lot of just land loss here, but look at this marshy incursion and look where the water table appears to be moving up towards the surface and this big crescent right outside of the National Mall. And if you are acquainted at all with the Smithsonian's, perhaps through the eyes of Nick Cage, you may be aware there's a lot of basement structures here in our national treasure area. So we're talking about serious risks to our national culture, to our national treasures, to this place that's so important for our national memory. As we're looking at this crescent-shaped line here, I want to draw your attention to a different figure. Let's step out of this map for a minute. So this figure, 21.7, it's about projected changes in coastal forests, but it's really useful for understanding sea level rise and how it can have impacts far inland across the eastern seaboard. So in New Jersey, you might know they're having these emerging ghost forests where patches of the forest are dying pretty far inland. That's because as the water table comes up, we can see marshiness appear pretty far inland related to sea level rise. And we can see migration of these salty transition zones where some more salt water starts getting into the freshwater. When we look at this crescent here in DC, we should assume there's substantial water table changes occurring in this whole area inside the crescent. Let's go look at Baltimore and then we'll look at the Chesapeake Bay. So Baltimore area, similar to DC, we see some current marshiness behavior. At two feet, we have kind of an unusual combination of factors occurring here where we see some inundation and marshiness in these industrial sites and also in what look to be fairly expensive housing areas with Peach Orchard Co. looking to take the first impacts. And then let's look at this area, looking at a 10 feet of rise. And look, we see complete inundation. We see complete loss of some fairly high value housing areas. And look, from what we were talking about with that green crescent around DC, we can see that this whole industrial complex, you have a lot of water table rising up throughout there. This is gonna be a big challenge. Just like in D.C., you know, if you go back at D.C., you look a little bit up north in Montgomery County, a lot of housing stock is fine. Here, outside of Baltimore, incredibly developed area, right? A lot of people live here. Most of these homes not directly impacted by sea level rise. I think, though, it's very important to think about if you live, say, in Parkville, you need to understand what's going on with your local utility and how all of this trouble down here is going to impact that. Like, what's your sewage output? Is it going to be overtopped? Is the changing water table going to impact what it feels like in your area? And where's your intake for your water system? Is it an aquifer that could be impacted by saltwater incursion? These are good questions to think about as you decide if you're going to stay or go. Looking over at Chesapeake Bay now, this is very sad. Even at two feet, even at the most moderate sea level rise we're likely to face, we can see extensive land loss, and it's not just land loss of farms, it's land loss of our history. You can see there are important historical sites and wildlife refuges that are going to be hit first. And this is very sad, this is very upsetting. As we move towards 10 feet, we see tremendous land loss. And in communities that people have probably been living on this land for many generations, this is beloved land. And I don't think the people of Bozeman are gonna have the same resources as the people of Baltimore on a city level, on a local level to deal with this level of change. This is an American tragedy that we're looking at in Chesapeake Bay. And I wanna show you here in figure 21.9, people don't have insurance. You can see that in these extremely vulnerable areas that we just highlighted, there's a 50% or less, 10 to 50% uptake of flood insurance. When I was a kid, my parents' house flooded and we didn't have flood insurance. It was a very difficult time for my parents, financially and emotionally difficult time. I would be unsurprised if it becomes increasingly difficult to obtain flood insurance in all of Maryland's vulnerable areas. Thinking about how to handle these very difficult problems, you could try to control them with a seawall, but I don't know. How much of a seawall can you build? Can you cover the whole eastern seaboard? 
And we're not doing the level of infrastructure work we need to handle this today, that's for sure. Probably on an individual and community level, pulling back from the ocean is a better plan. It makes me really sad to see all of that beautiful farmland going under. Let's just take a minute and look at our fisheries outlook. If you're one of the families working to feed America, this picture is a little bit of good news for you in Maryland. This picture over here, it's a big blurry picture of biomass, just how many living things are in the ocean. You want a lighter color here because that's less change and the change is negative change. So we can see that this currently extremely rich area in terms of living things, lots of living things there. We don't know from this figure exactly what's gonna be there, but it looks like there's gonna be stuff there. There's going to be a lot of abundance in the ecosystems and the offshore life moving up towards Maryland. I'm glad to be able to give some positive news to people in Maryland who work to feed America. And you know, the work that's been done in America's fisheries is really important for sustainability and really impressive. We have a much better sustainable fishery model than most developed nations. And if we handle sea level rise well, if we do what the Army Corps of Engineers is doing now and we use a green coastlines program that's designed for a managed retreat and for stabilizing with native plants and native shellfish coastlines as long as we can, that kind of planned pullback where we clean up industrial sites before the waters rise, where we eliminate things that aren't natural ways to hold the coastline, you can imagine. The Chesapeake Bay could continue to be an incredibly rich, productive area. It could continue to be an amazing source of sustainable harvest from the sea. Let's talk about fire now, because that's an emerging risk in many areas across the country. So this is figure 7.4, and we do see an elevated risk emerging in Western Maryland. But let's do the math before we get freaked out by these dark colors. So over here, we can see that Western Maryland used to have maybe one day every 20 years where there was a big risk of fire. We have to multiply that by the change in number of days expressed as a percentage. I'm sure that's very natural for all of you too. Uh, looks like maybe 75%, 100, 150% change for Western Maryland. It's hard for me to interpret these subtle shades of colors. I'm sorry. But that means that at worst, if we do the most like uh, risk sensitive uh, analysis of your increased fire risk. It's like every eight years, you might have a very dangerous state for very large fires. And moving every 20 to every eight years, I would not have a reaction like, I've got to freak out, I've got to get out now. To me, that would be a sign that it's time to work on increasing my home and community's resilience against wildfire. The kinds of solid old construction we find in large parts of that area with that elevated fire risk have excellent potential for fire resilience. I, I really would get more motivated to dig in from that news. So summing this up, you can see there's some real good news and bad news for Maryland. When I look up and down the East Coast, there are many East Coast cities that are expecting way crazier increases in summer heat. I know that your summers are already pretty warm. You're not seeing massive increases. You're just going to have a couple more very southern feeling weeks. And I know those days over 95 are gross in a humid environment. It's the same at my place. A couple more weeks over 95 does not sound delightful in places like ours. But when you look at the national projections, Houston's getting an extra 45 days minimum over 95 with high humidity. There are several major, major cities where the energy demand is going to be hard to handle. In Maryland, your winter changes and precipitation changes also, they're kind of as good as it gets in these years of change. You got relatively moderate change on all three of those major change axes. However, you do have an emerging fire threat where you need to harden against fire and you have a really serious sea level rise problem to deal with. I would compare you to say New Jersey when you think about this sea level rise problem. They also have, unfortunately, major seasonal changes expected alongside an equally serious sea level rise issue. I would say, Maryland, when you look at your neighbors, you look pretty good, especially towards the West. You've got change, yes, but it's less severe, especially in the West than in almost all parts of the U.S. That little quadrant towards the West where we saw that good summer cool conservation, 
that's a lovely pocket right there. That is so nice. In terms of direct threats to communities and human well-being, there's a lot of fairly good conserved territory in Maryland. However, the costs to the state of all that sea level rise stuff is very serious. Financially, I don't know how the state's going to handle it, but it's hard to imagine that it's not going to impact other areas of the budget. In states that are highly impacted by sea level rise, I do advise thinking through some things before you decide to stick around. If you're anywhere near the coast, with a broad definition of what it means to be anywhere near the coast, look up information on your local water table. What's going on with your water and sewer utilities? Look into it. Look into where sewer outflows are. Look into where drinking water comes from. Look at what your current water table is. And think about how much you trust your local government and utility companies to take care of these issues for you. If your trust is high, that's awesome. If it's not so good, I'd get out while the getting's good. There's not going to be as much money to fix things as there are going to be things that need fixing. If you can get any of your local water people to sit down with you informally, I find that water people are often very willing to give you the straight talk over a beer. From having such conversations with utility workers in and around New York City, I can tell you, everyone I spoke with there was very seriously concerned about these issues once I got them loosened up and told me they didn't have the funding they needed to address these problems. That being said, Overall, I would describe Maryland as having the potential for quite robust resilience in the face of change, even if AMOC goes down. New York's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. I want you to check that one out if you want to see some real problems towards the coast. I want to let you know, New York, though, this pattern that we saw in Maryland, where the as you got away from the ocean, it's looking good. There's some great territory in New York, as well as some very serious challenges. In this time of change, it's all about relative risk and relative challenge. Maryland, I'm wishing you all the best, and I definitely think you've got a shot. We can prepare for what's coming and build the best future we can. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching and thanks for joining us. AR has recently passed a milestone. We've reached more than 100,000 people in America with detailed local climate information, and it's thanks to the incredible support of the AR community. There are so many folks committing their financial resources, their energy, their time to helping this information get out there. I'm so grateful to all of you, and I'm so glad that we're doing this together. Thanks for being there with me. I'm going to keep an eye on the news. I'm going to keep an eye on high consensus science. I'm going to try and get you what you need as we go through this together.